Hi everyone, Mrs. Hansen, one more time with our final topics in chapter five. We have two topics remaining, both based on stoichiometric calculations that we've been working on. The first of the two remaining topics is a percent yield, and the second will be limiting and excess reagents. So let's begin with section 5.9, the topic of percent yield. First, we're going to define the term theoretical yield. The theoretical yield we define to be the amount of product expected from a given amount of reactant based on the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. So when I think of the term theoretical yield, I want you to just think of your calculated answer. You and your calculator working a stoichiometry problem, arriving at a final answer is your theoretical yield. Let's suppose you're given a mass of a reactant and you perform the three steps of stoichiometry to determine the mass of a product. We call those mass mass products. A mass mass problem gives you a calculated answer, which we would call our theoretical yield. Oftentimes, when we actually get up to the lab and we run an experiment, we see that generally we have less than the maximum amount of product predicted. And this is either just by loss of sample, which is just a part of being human in the lab, or sometimes you actually have a competing uh, equation, a competing reaction occurring, which is also making the yield a little less than expected, or can actually be just part of the experimental design. So for instance, if I have a lot of transferring of uh, reagents, I have a potential loss of sample each time. So just many reasons why experimental error or experimental design can lead to less than the calculated answer predicts. And we compare the actual yield, what we got in the lab, to the theoretical yield, what we calculated, we get what's called a percent yield. So the actual yield is what you got from running the experiment, right? It's what's sitting in your dish at the end of your lab and you go to the scale and you weigh it. How much physical sample do you have? The theoretical yield we mentioned is our calculated answer. We sit with our stoichiometry roadmap and we're calculator and we could predict if everything were perfect, what we should be able to yield. The ratio of actual to theoretical expressed as a percent is known as the percent yield. I think of this as just a measure of the efficiency of the reaction. You know, a 100% efficient reaction, you're gonna end up with the exact same amount as you predicted from doing math. It's very rare, but 100% efficiency is a goal although it's very rare to achieve. So for example, this is not a calculation, but just emphasizing uh, the two terms. If a reaction forms 25 grams of product, so you, you're in the lab and you walk to the scale with your experimental value and you find that there's 25 grams of your sample sitting in your dish. And when you sat down and actually calculated with your stoichiometry roadmap, you calculated that you should have got 40 grams of your product. You compare what you actually got from doing the experiment to what you calculated you should have got using your mass mass skills, and you express that as the efficiency of your equation. How efficient were you? About 62.5% in this case. That's a little low, don't you think? <laughs> Let's try an example problem on the bottom of page 12. It reads, when carbon is, or when charcoal is burned, the carbon it contains reacts with oxygen from the air and it forms carbon dioxide. So you can see solid carbon combining with uh, molecular oxygen forming a molecule of carbon dioxide. Do you recognize that pattern of change? We called it a combination. The combination has just one product on the arrow side. What is the theoretical yield of carbon dioxide in grams? Oh, so we'd like to know how many grams, question mark, like I'm out funny, how many grams are we supposed to get of carbon dioxide if we're given 0.5 moles of carbon? 
So we're given moles of carbon. We want to know grams of carbon dioxide. We called this a mole mass problem on our stoichiometry roadmap. Given a mole, calculate a mass. So we're right in the heartland of our stoichiometry roadmap where we're at the unit mole. We need a conversion factor in the heart of our chapter here of a want over given. Those mole ratios are conversion factors and those moles are really just those coefficients in front of reactants and products. What is it that we want to know? Well, we want the carbon dioxide. Its coefficient is a one. The unit we were given came from the carbon. Its coefficient is also a one. So that's nice, a one over one stoichiometric ratio. Since we needed to go all the way to grams of the product, CO2, I need a step three on our stoichiometry roadmap. We know that after we set up our ratio, of our want over given, we need to multiply by the molar mass of what we want. The molar mass of carbon dioxide. Well, carbon has a molar mass of 12.01. Oxygen is 16, so that's 32. Adding that together, we get 44.01 grams. Notice that conversion factor, molar mass over mole. Now just take a moment and process. We've canceled moles in step one of carbon. In step two, we canceled moles of carbon dioxide and we will land at a gram of CO2. So we multiply by molar mass of want in our last step of stoichiometry. So 0.5, whoops, calculator on, 0.5 times 1 over 1 times 44.01. And my screen reads 22.005, so I'll report one decimal, 22 grams of carbon dioxide. This is your theoretical yield, our calculated answer. Part B asks us, what is the percent yield if 10 grams of carbon dioxide are formed? Well, if 10 grams are formed, that's your actual yield. We saw that we should have reported 22 grams, and we're just going to express that as a percent. If you actually, you know, in the experiment, set over your theoretical is the calculated answer, 10 divided by 22 times 100 to get it as a percent. Our reaction was 45.4% efficient. Mm, that's kind of low, don't you think? We lost a lot of sample there. More than half was lost. Let's try another. Flip over to top of page 13. Here we have an example of a recipe where it says acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol. See this molecule right here, acetaminophen. Looks pretty complex, it's an organic molecule. It's prepared by the reaction below, well, that's really above for us. Uh, what is the percent yield when 60 grams, this is my given, I'm given 60 grams of four amino phenol. That's an organic nomenclature. Next semester, no panics now. Next term, we do organic chemistry. So our given amount is 60 grams of 4-aminophenol. It reacts with acetyl chloride, and it forms 70 grams of acetaminophen. So this is what it's telling me you actually made. What we need to determine is the theoretical value so we can compare the ratio. So we need to do a mass mass problem. We were given a mass of the reactant. We need to calculate the mass of the product. Then we can compare the efficiency of the reaction by actual over theoretical. So let's start with our given amount. We started with 60 grams 
of four amino phenol. And if I'm just going to abbreviate amino phenol, AP. Now I know I need three steps to stoichiometry, starting with a mass mass ratio. So here we're getting my three parentheses ready, knowing that the heart of my equation is always the mole mole ratio, where we use our want over given coefficients to represent mole ratios. We know in the first step of stoichiometry, we always divide, and we'll divide by molar mass of given. Then we ratio, then we multiply, and that third step is the molar mass of what we want. This will guide us to find the grams of acetaminophen, and if it's all right, I'll just write acet, and you'll know I mean acetaminophen. So step one, we started with 60 grams of four amino phenol. Do you see how nice they were? They gave us the molar mass of that reactant, so I didn't have to spend time adding it up. So the molar mass of four amino phenol is 109.1 grams. We want to know acetaminophen. Well, its coefficient is a one, that's nice as well as the coefficient for four amino phenol. It's a one-to-one -one coefficient ratio. The molar mass of what we want is also given. That's 151.2 grams in every one mole of my acetaminophen, and I'm gonna just abbreviate that. So just examine our steps. Step one, we got grams to cancel of our reactant for amino phenol. Step two, we set up a coefficient mole-mole ratio of want over given. It's a critical step, and I know that they're all coefficients of one here, but I don't want to leave that step out because not every equation has all coefficients of one. So get in the practice of always included your want over given ratio. And then in the last step, we're going to multiply by the molar mass of what we want. That's the acetaminophen. Let me hit this out with you. 60 divided by 109.1 times 1 over 1 times 151.2. And what did you find? Does your screen match mine of 83.15? I'll say 83.2 grams, just rounding a little bit. This is now our theoretical yield. It's our calculated answer to our mass mass problem. Now, it said you really made 70 grams. Your calculated answer was 83.2 grams, so that's your theoretical. When you express that ratio as a percentage, you get what's known as the percent yield, a measure of the efficiency of the reaction. 84.2% yield. A mass mass problem with a little ratio at the end is all we're really doing. There is a next question that goes with this very same equation. What is the theoretical yield of acetaminophen from 80 grams of 4 amino phenol and calculate its percent yield. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video and try this practice problem on your own. Before we move on to limiting reagents, try one on your own and come back when you're ready to practice and ready to hear the answer and just compare. Go to work. Okay, welcome back. I hope you didn't cheat yourself of the practice. Very critical. We'd like to know the theoretical yield of acetaminophen in grams if 80 grams were our starting amount. So friends, the only difference between the one we work together and the one we're about to work is the starting mass. Instead of 60 grams, we're going to start with four grams of 80 grams of 4 AP. I'm going to uh, just abbreviate that. You remember what AP stood for? It's up here in your recipe, 4-amino-phenol. 
So for amino phenol, this time we're starting with 80 grams. Our same first step will occur because it's the same molar mass as up above. So this is 109.1 grams. We have the exact same mole ratio. The same target is acetaminophen for every one mole of 4AP. And the last step will be identical as well because we have the same target, acetaminophen. The only difference is that we started with 80 grams instead of our 60 grams above. Let me catch up to you. I'll divide this out. 80 divide by 109.1 times 1 over 1 times 151.2. And this time my answer was 110.9 grams. My calculated answer is called the theoretical yield. What is the percent yield if your reaction gave you 65.5 grams? So you, when you ran the lab, you retained 65 and a half grams of product. Your calculated answer said, well, you should have achieved 110.9 if it were 100% efficient. Clearly, we lost a little bit of sample here. Let's find the efficiency of this equation. 65.5 divided by that previous answer and express that as a percent. Looks like 59 point, I'll call that 59.1 percent yield. So the efficiency of our, our reaction, 59.1 percent. Your calculated answer is called your theoretical yield. Your actual yield is provided for you in the story problem simply because we know that you are not running the lab and you're doing paper pencil practice. So that actual yield is given to you. Let's turn to the last new topic called a limiting reactant. Sometimes you'll hear this called a limiting reagent. What happens if you run an equation other than from the perfect balanced recipe, you set up two terms known as the limiting and excess reagent. And I'd like to just do a simple example to kind of give meaning to these terms. A limiting reactant is a reactant that is completely used up in the reaction. Okay, so let's take a peek at a recipe. I know that a sandwich requires the following. I would need two slices of bread, let's say that's two slices of bread, to react with one piece of lunch meat, can I just call that lunch meat M, one piece of meat to create a product. When I create a product, I get something called a sandwich and I would have one sandwich form that's consistent of two pieces of bread and a piece of meat. So two pieces of bread combine with one lunch meat to form one sandwich. Now look what you've given. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of bread. So instead of a two, you're using an eight instead. So let's just keep tabs of what we're saying. Let's change the coefficient from a two to an eight. Eight pieces of bread sitting in that box there. And we now have three pieces of meat. When we changed the coefficients to something other than the perfect balanced equation, We set up two terms. We set up what's called the limiting reactant, and we're going to set up something called the excess reactant. I'm gonna abbreviate that as XS. Limiting reactant runs out first. Well, clearly you see that if I only have three pieces of lunch meat, and I have enough bread for actually four sandwiches, the lunch meat runs out first. So this is called the limiting reactant. If I can only build three sandwiches, 
I will have two pieces of bread left over. Now, what would have been the perfect recipe? Well, the perfect recipe would have had four pieces of meat available, and then I wouldn't have had any excess bread. Limiting and excess reagents occur when you change the coefficients to an unbalanced reaction. One of them will run out and therefore determines how much product can form. Once one of the ingredients runs out, the product can no longer occur. So that's the concept of limiting and excess reagents. Limiting reagents run out first and determine the maximum amount of product formed. The excess reagent is the one that you have leftovers of. Let's consider this molecular model here. It says, consider the reaction of hydrogen, diatomic molecule hydrogen, and oxygen, the diatomic molecule, those are both diatomics in their elemental form, and they form water, H2O. I know that this is called a combination reaction. Two elements are combining to form a single compound. And when I balance this equation, and that's what the whole chapter is focusing on, is obeying the law of conservation of mass, what is the most perfect recipe to create water? Well, that comes from the balanced equation. Two H's, two H's, good. Two O's, one O. All right, so let's balance the oxygens. And in doing so, I have to then repair the hydrogens. So the perfect balanced equation is the most efficient recipe. In other words, there's no limiting an excess reagent if I run using the perfectly balanced equation. For every two molecules of hydrogen, I need one molecule of oxygen, and I will form two molecules of water. That's the perfect, most efficient recipe. Well, let's turn our attention to what we were given here. I have one, two, three, four molecules of hydrogen, and I have one, two, three, molecules of oxygen. Is that the most perfect recipe? The most perfect recipe is a two to one ratio. Clearly a four to three is not the same as a two to one ratio. So let's kind of go through and, and focus on what we're saying with using these molecular models. For every two hydrogens, I require one oxygen. So thinking about that, what have we made by consuming those? I've made a water molecule, two H's and an O, and there's gonna be two of them there, right? There's two water molecules that form. So here's an oxygen, here's a hydrogen, hydrogen. Here's an oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So for every two H's, Every two H's and every one oxygen, I get out two waters. Well, I still have to go. There's still more stuff in there. So let's take out, oh my goodness, look at that. There's no more hydrogen. I have two H's right there. You know, I'm one molecule, but that's not enough to make another oxygen, is it? I, I run out. So my goodness, that's as far as I got. So what else is left in there? Well, let's see. If I have two oxygens, okay, so we're gonna just use up that oxygen and we're gonna do so by using one more molecule. Let's see. We've got a recipe for water. We know that we need one oxygen for every two hydrogens. And so there is two hydrogens here, right here. And so that means of this, I can take out just one more of those oxygen right there, leaving another atom of oxygen, two H's and an O. So we can make another hydrogen. Oops, I'm writing O instead of the art. So here's our 
water, our third water molecule, and now, you know what, the, uh, the hydrogen, it's gone, isn't it? And what else is still in there? Well, we have some excess oxygen, and even an individual atom of oxygen, because it was only achieved right here. The hydrogen ran out first. When it did, it's now identified as the limiting reactant. What did we have extra of? Well, we had extra oxygens, right? Plenty of oxygens left in there that were not consumed. And so oxygen is the excess reagent. It's what you had extra of, not all used up. The limiting reactant determined how much water was formed. All right, so I wanted to just go through this little bit of molecular art to just drive home that the recipe, if it were perfect, two molecules of hydrogen would be present for every one molecule of oxygen. Clearly, we saw a different ratio. So for every two molecules of oxygen, we need one molecule of oxygen, two hydrogens for one oxygen, two hydrogens for one oxygen, and what we saw here was an excess of the oxygen. So we had enough to make water molecules, but we had an excess amount of oxygen. So we actually formed one, two, three, four molecules of water, and we had one extra oxygen. The excess reagent was not consumed. All right, let's put this into a, a chemical reaction and kind of just compare excess and limiting reagents. So I'm going to flip over and find page 14. And this question is reading, determining the limiting reactant under each of the following conditions. Notice our recipe says for every two moles of hydrogen, we need one mole of oxygen to form two moles of water, a two to one to two. And what happens is when you change the coefficients from one balanced equation using a set that is no longer balanced, we set up terms called the limiting and excess reagent. And I'm just going to set up a little table here so we can just put in the mole values and just keep track of letters A, B, C, and D. Let's suppose we use five moles of hydrogen and five moles of oxygen. What is the limiting and excess reagent? Well, the perfect balanced equation says for every two moles of hydrogen, we need one mole of oxygen. That's our ratio as a two to one mole ratio. So what was given to us? We had five moles of oxygen and five moles of hydrogen. We had a five to five ratio. Well, hydrogen is supposed to be twice as big, and it's not, is it? So one way to think about that is just looking at a mole ratio, a two to one, and if I multiply that by, let's say five moles of oxygen, do you see how our moles of oxygen would cancel? And we would then see that 10 moles of hydrogen would be required. Right, twice as big as five is 10. So the perfect ratio would be 10 to five, and it's not, it's only five to five. So the limiting reagent is the hydrogen. It runs out first, leaving excess amounts of oxygen. The maximum amount of product form comes from the limiting reagent. If I start with five moles of hydrogen, notice that two moles of water form for every two moles of hydrogen that's consumed. So that would give me five moles of water. If every two makes two, five would make five. 
The excess reagent is the oxygen. It is not used in determining the maximum amount of water. Let's try another. Let's go to letter B, practice makes permanent. Now it says, let's start with, oops, I erased the whole equation. Let me rewrite, we have two moles of H2 plus an oxygen giving us two moles of water. What if we started with five moles of hydrogen and eight moles of oxygen? Is that a perfect two to one ratio? Well, if five moles was excess <laughs> up above, eight moles is even more, clearly you see that that's going to be too big. Just prove it to yourself. Five moles of hydrogen would require, we have a one to two mole ratio for the oxygen to hydrogen. It only requires 2.5 moles, and we saw that right up here. Half of this would be 2.5 moles. So again, this is going to be your limiting reagent. It's not twice as big. It's not even as big. This is going to be your excess reagent, and therefore the maximum amount of water, again, will be 5 moles. Now let's try 8 moles of hydrogen and 2 moles of oxygen. Now, is, this is not, again, a perfect two to one ratio. Clearly, I can see the hydrogen is way too large, right? So let's compose. Let's start with the oxygen this time, just to show you that there's lots of right ways. We know that two moles of hydrogen are required for every one mole of oxygen. That's our perfect ratio. So two times as big would give four moles of hydrogen as a requirement. I would only need four moles, but I have eight. Certainly that's way too big. So this time the oxygen is my limiting reagent and this guy is the excess reagent. The limiting reagent determines the maximum amount of product formed. So now your two moles of oxygen will determine the amount of water. And do you see that coefficient ratio two molecules of water form for every one mole of oxygen. So two times two is four waters. And there's one more in letter D. We have two moles of oxygen, I'm gonna write it above, and, two, and five moles of oxygen. Well again, that's clearly too big. The hydrogen here then is the limiting reagent and therefore your maximum amount will be two moles of water. I mean that's the balanced equation. For every two moles of hydrogen I only needed one mole and they gave me five. That's way too much. But they still will only produce two moles of water. Really these are just mole mole problems aren't they? Let's look at another molecular model and draw a representation of how much product formed and what reactant molecules were left over. Three molecules of hydrogen are required for one molecule of nitrogen to form two molecules of ammonia, a three to one to two. Let's tally what we have. One, two, we have three moles or three molecules of nitrogen and one, two, three molecules of hydrogen. So we have an equal amount, don't we? Well, the recipe says we're going to need to consume three times as many hydrogens as a nitrogen. So let's think about that in terms of what's happening during a chemical change. Reactants get used, products get made, we need three hydrogens, one, two, three, for every one nitrogen. And when we do so, out come two ammonia, right? So just to highlight the two that we're about to make. So an ammonia would consist of an N to three H's, right? An N and three H's. And then the, the nitrogen 
I got two molecules left over, don't I? They're still in there, aren't they? So we had excess amounts by two molecules. And we used all three, so they're gone for the hydrogen. And what formed were two molecules of ammonia. And so we have the excess reagent being represented um, by the two molecules of N2 that remained after the reaction occurred. It's a nice visual to tell us about limiting and excess reagents. Now that we've examined that molecular art, let's try some on our own here. Using the same grid, we'll do 3H2s plus N2 yielding 2 NH3s. The perfect balanced equation. In letter A, it says, what if we started with 1.5 moles of hydrogen and 1.0 moles of nitrogen? What's the maximum amount of ammonia we could make? Well, let's find the limiting reagent. If I started my reaction with the hydrogen, what would be the maximum amount of ammonia I could make? Well, I would see from the balanced equation that two moles of ammonia requires three moles of hydrogen. I'm going to do two separate mole-mole problems and compare my answers. And when I say that, I just want to do one, one mole mole starting from the first reactant hydrogen, and let's get an answer. What's 1.5 times the mole ratio of 2 thirds? Right, so I'm given a mole, calculate a mole. We're just in the heart of our problem, our want over given. So 1.5 times two-thirds. That's one mole of ammonia. So let's see what the next reactant would give us. If one mole of nitrogen is also present, what would be the maximum yield starting there? Well, the coefficient ratio here becomes two moles of ammonia for every one mole of nitrogen. Right, the balanced equation shows a two to one stoichiometric ratio. So two times one, well this would be two moles of ammonia. What's the maximum yield? Well, it's your smaller number. The smaller number tells you the maximum yield from those two mole ratios. And so this right here would be one mole. Your excess reagent would be nitrogen, excess amounts, and your limiting reagent would be hydrogen because it gave you the smaller of the two answers. We did two separate mole-mole problems. Starting from the hydrogen, we calculated the moles of product. In a next example, we started with moles of nitrogen and went to moles of product. We then compared our two answers, realizing that the maximum yield is the smaller of the two and that the reagent, the reactant, the starting material that led us to the smaller answer would be known as the limiting reagent, and the excess reagent gave us the bigger number. Let's try another. I'm going to just erase my work so I have room to do the next example. There, finally. Let's try letter B. This time we have one mole of hydrogen given two moles of nitrogen. That's not a perfect three to one ratio. You probably can tell right now that since hydrogen is supposed to be three times bigger and it's not even as big that it's going to be its limiting reagent. But let me just show you the math. I'm going to start with one mole of hydrogen as the given and I want to do a mole ratio to calculate the maximum amount of ammonia formed. So for every two moles of ammonia formed, it required three moles of hydrogen. Two thirds of one, and you could just hit that as two over three, and you get 0.67 moles of ammonia. 
if I did a separate reaction, separate mole comparison, starting with molecular nitrogen, we would see two moles of ammonia form for every one mole of nitrogen. And this would give us four moles of product. Well, clearly you see you can only make as much as the smaller of your two answers. And so the hydrogen is the limiting reagent. The nitrogen is the excess reagent. And the maximum yield is the smaller of your two answers. If hydrogen is supposed to be three times bigger, it's not big enough. Therefore, it is used to determine the maximum yield of product. Let's try a letter C. Given two moles of hydrogen and three moles of nitrogen, what's the maximum amount of product you can make? And again, you can see right off the bat, hydrogen is supposed to be three times bigger. It is not. It's not even as big, so hydrogen will be the limiting reagent. Let's prove it to ourselves. For every two moles of hydrogen, how many moles of ammonia can form? And so we just use our coefficient ratio of want over given. Two moles of ammonia form for every three moles of hydrogen. So two thirds of two is 1.33. If we had started with the nitrogen, we can prove to ourselves that we will make a larger number and its ratio of two to one from the balanced equation would show that you could produce six moles of ammonia had you started with the three moles of nitrogen. Clearly the maximum yield is the smaller of the two. The reactant that gave you the smaller answer is your limiting reagent. The Reactant that gave you the larger number is in excess amounts. Are you ready for D? Let's take a peek at letter D. This time we're given seven and a half moles of hydrogen. And two moles of nitrogen. So seven and a half moles of hydrogen. Let's find the maximum yield knowing that two moles of ammonia form for every three moles of hydrogen consumed. What's two thirds of 7.5? That's five on my screen. Well, let's compare the two moles of nitrogen and see what that gives us for a yield. Now the coefficients changed, right? We had two moles of NH3 consuming just one mole of nitrogen. So the two over one mole ratio would lead to four moles of ammonia. We can only make as much as the smaller of the two answers. The nitrogen here was the limiting reagent and the hydrogen was in excess amounts really just redundancy of mole mole problems. Let's expand it out a little further now and try some mass mass problems with limiting reagents. Here I'm given 10 grams of molecular nitrogen and it reacts with 10 grams of oxygen. Calculate the maximum amount of NO that can form. I want you to do two separate mass mass problems and just compare your answers. You can only make as much as the smaller of your two yields. Two separate mass mass problems, starting with 10 grams of nitrogen. So we're right over here at 10 grams. We'll know that we need to do step one, step two, step three to get to grams of NO. So why don't I get my three parentheses ready, the three steps of stoichiometry, where I know to divide, ratio, multiply. And I know my first step is saying divide by molar mass of what we're given. Our stoichiometric ratio, the coefficients of want 
over given. And then I know we're going to multiply by molar mass of what we want. So we need to do a little molar mass work. Molecular nitrogen, well I know N has a molar mass of 14, I think it's 14.01, so we'll say that's 28.02 for a molecular, whoops. So two N's added together. What about our ratio? We want to know NO, its coefficient is a two. We're starting from nitrogen, its coefficient is a one. So a two to one coefficient ratio. And then we multiply by what we want. So over here, nitrogen with its molar mass of 14, oxygen is 16 on the NOS, so let's say 30.01 is the molar mass of NO. Let's find our first possible answer. 10 divided by the molar mass of 28.02 times the mole ratio of 2 over 1 times 30.01. 21.42 grams of NO. Okay. Well, all right, that's our first starting mass mass problem. Let's also start with 10 grams of oxygen. And when I set up my ratio of divide, ratio, multiply, see my three conversion factors, I still have the same target, grams of NO. This time, since we're starting with molecular oxygen, we use its molar mass in the first step. Adding two oxygens together gives me 32 grams. Our mole ratio of two molecules of NO are formed for every one molecule of oxygen consumed. And the molar mass is still 30.01 grams for the target there, the NO. We divide, we ratio, we multiply. Let's start with 10 grams of oxygen and see the yield. 10 divided by 32 times 2 times 30.01. My screen reads 18.7, I'll round 18.8, .8, well, I'll keep two decimals, 18.76. All right, two separate mass mass problems. Now let's examine what we've accomplished here. The smaller of the two answers is 18.76. The reactant that gave me that answer was oxygen. The reactant that gave me the larger answer was nitrogen. So here's the labels for all of that work. The maximum yield is the smaller of our two answers, 18.76. The reactant that gave us the smaller answer is known as the limiting reactant. Sometimes you hear it called limiting reagent. The reactant that gave me the bigger answer is in excess amounts, so it is the excess reagent. Two separate mass-mass problems, and we've accomplished finding out the maximum yield. You practice. It's fun to watch me, I'm sure, but try letter A and B and tell me the maximum amount of product form. You try it, come back when ready. Let's try letter A. 12.5 grams of nitrogen. We're going to convert that into a mole by using its molar mass. That was 28.02 grams. We want to know the maximum amount of product, so its coefficient of two moles for every one mole of nitrogen. The molar mass we said was 30.01. Is that right? 14 and 16, that's 30.01 grams of NO in every one mole. So my first strategy is to solve for the grams of NO starting with nitrogen. Then I'll compare that answer to 15 grams of oxygen 
and I'm going to follow the same steps of stoichiometry but using the molar mass of O2, using the mole ratio of NO to that of oxygen, and then again the same third step because we still have that same target, one mole of NO with its molar mass of 30. I want to compare those two answers knowing my maximum yield is just the smaller of the two. So let me hit for us 12.5 divided by 28.02 times 2 over 1 times 30.01. And my screen says 26.78 grams of NO. Let me hit the second series. 15 over 32 times 2 times 30.01 and this reads 28.13. So my maximum yield is the smaller of the two answers. And therefore my limiting reagent was nitrogen and the excess reagent was oxygen. So we've determined the maximum yield was 26.78 that the limiting reagent gave us the smaller answer and the excess reagent gave us the bigger answer. How'd you do? Well, in letter B, the only difference now is the starting numbers. So the very starting number, 14.0 grams of N2 and 13.0 grams of O2. But we have the same work above. So let me just hit those again and find those two answers. So starting with 14 grams of N2, 14 divided by 28.02 times 2 over 1 times 30.01. And my screen reads 29.99, okay, about 30 grams there. Let's hit the second, starting at 13. Divide by 32 times 2 over 1 times 30.01, and this is 24.38. So this time we found the maximum yield to be 24.38 grams. The reagent that gave us the maximum yield, the limiting reagent, and the one that gave us the bigger answer is the excess reagent. Our maximum yield is the smaller of the two answers. The limiting reagent or reactant is our starting material that led to the smaller answer. And the excess material would be the nitrogen. It gave us the bigger answer. Even more practice. And if this didn't print very well in your um, note pack, let's kind of clarify what it's asking us to do. We're given different amounts of reactants and we're going to just fill in the chart. So shall we draw it out together so you kind of have a better idea of what you see? We have a balanced chemical equation and if, if that part is easy enough to read, see it? C2H4 plus 3O2s, maybe I'll just leave it right on the same slide. C2H4 plus three O2s points to two CO2s and two H2Os. What if we started with eight molecules of C2H4 and 15 molecules of oxygen? What's used or formed and how much remains at the end of the equation? Alrighty, so Again, we notice that we need one molecule of C2H4 for every three molecules of oxygen. A one to three is the perfect ratio. Where is if we had a one to three, we wouldn't have any limiting or excess reagents. But an eight to 15 is not that same ratio. Three times as big as eight is 24. So 24 oxygen should be, consume, should be there to consume all eight molecules. It's not big enough. So let's test that out. 
I'm going to say for every eight molecules of C2H4, I just want to emphasize how I'm getting that, I require three moles of oxygen for every one mole of C2H4. So the perfect ratio would be an 8 to 24. You see that? Even though 15 is bigger than 8, it's not three times bigger than 8. So the oxygen is going to be the limiting reagent. And the C2H4 is going to be the excess reagent. We need 24 molecules. You only have 15. It's not big enough. And therefore, it will run out before all of these eight molecules get consumed. So we've determined the excess reagent. We've determined the limiting reagent. And we understand that the limiting reagent determines everything else. All right, so we're gonna do some mole ratios here. If I start with the limiting reagent of 15 molecules of O2, let's determine how many molecules of the C2H4 were indeed consumed. So the coefficient in front of C2H4 is a one. The coefficient in front of the oxygen is a two. What's one third of 15? Well, that's five, isn't it? If I had eight in there and five molecules were used up, we have three molecules in excess amounts, unused. You know, the very definition of a limiting reagent is that it's completely consumed in that reaction. So it's gone. That's why there's excess of the other reactant. Again, let's start with 15 molecules of O2. And now I'm going to target the carbon dioxide. Its coefficient is two moles of CO2. Let me give myself some room. Let's start with our 15 molecules of oxygen. And this time we're gonna target the carbon dioxide. We have to do both products. We'll just pick the CO2 first. And we can see that the mole ratio produces two moles of carbon dioxide for every three moles of oxygen. So what's two thirds of 15? Well, that's 10, isn't it? So that's how many molecules. So over here, we had 10 molecules form. And since this is the same exact number, you're gonna get the same number of water. So just showing that work to verify the water moles comes out to be the exact same number. So, when we started with an eight to 15 to zero to zero, we recognized that the oxygen was going to run out first. And when it did so, all of it was consumed, leaving none left. We saw that of the eight molecules provided for us, five were used, giving us three molecules left over. And the number of carbon dioxide and water were both 10. So 10 formed and 10 remained at the very end. So a lot of mole ratios that just take practice. You have practice, practice, practice. I'm gonna keep working these. I just encourage you to pause your video and do the remaining problems on page 15 and page 16 and give yourself the chance to practice those. Pause the video, work them, and then come back to check. C2H4 reacts with HCl to form C2H5Cl. If eight grams of ethylene 
and 12 grams of HCl are used, how many moles of each reactant are used? This is just a mole map problem. Given a mass, convert it to a mole. We know to divide by molar mass. 8 grams of C2H4, and we're going to need the molar mass of C2H4 to use as our conversion factor to end with a mole. Let's add that up. Carbon is 12, so that's 24, plus 4 more on the hydrogen, that's 28 grams. 8 divided by 28 is 0.29 moles. The other part of that question said, if 12 grams of HCl were used, how many moles is that? That molar mass you found to be 36.5 for the H added to a Cl. 12 over that molar mass is 0.33. Letter B. What's the limiting reactant? We'll notice that they're exactly the same, a one to one mole ratio. So therefore, the smaller answer is going to be the limiting reagent. The C2H4 is smaller than the HCl when they're supposed to be the same number. How many moles of product form? Well, that's this guy, right? So I'm going to start my equation from the limiting reactant. Notice we have a nice one-to-one -one mole ratio. C2H5Cl is a 1, as is our limiting reactant, C2H4. And this is the heart of our problem, our coefficient ratio of want over given. So notice that the same number that you started with will give you the same number of product moles. How many grams of product is that? Well, that's just asking us to do that last step, right? We divided, we then ratioed, now we're going to multiply. So I need to add carbon, hydrogen, and a chlorine and I'm going to get that molar mass for us. And that I found to be 64.5. So that's my exchange out now. 64.5 grams is your molar mass. And I'll have to come down here. So 0.29 times that molar mass. And that's 18.71. And that's called our theoretical yield, the maximum amount of product we can make coming from the excess reagent. Then it says, suppose that you actually ran the equation and you had 10 grams or 10.6 grams of product form. That was what we defined to be our actual yield. We calculated we were supposed to get 18.71 grams. That was what we called our theoretical yield and we're going to express that as a percent. Ooh, that's 56.7% yield. I'll take that, 56.7% yield. The measure of the efficiency of the reaction. Now that incorporated a lot of good stuff. I had to remember Mole, mole, mass, mass problems. I had to do a percent yield. You need to have practiced that so often that you're becoming proficient with all of the types of problems. Are you ready to check the next one? Let's take a peek at it. Here we have CH4 plus two molecules of chlorine giving us C2H2C, H2Cl2, and two HCLs. Suppose I had five grams of methane and 15 grams of chlorine. How many moles of each reactant? So that's converting grams to moles. That's an old mole map problem. I need molar mass to do that. I'm going to add four hydrogens, 12 plus four, that's 16 grams. 
And down here, I need to add two chlorines together and find its molar mass. Let's see, 35.5, I'll call that 71. Let me hit that. 5 divided by 16 is 0 0.3125. I know I'm carrying too many decimals. 0 0.31, you want to just leave it 0 0.31? 0 0.31. And then 15 over 71 is 0 0.211, 0 0.21 moles of chlorine. All right, there's letter A. Which one is your limiting reactant? Well, I can see chlorine is supposed to be twice as big. Is it? <laughs> no, it's not even as big. So this guy will be your limiting reactant. Prove it to yourself, 0 0.21 moles of chlorine and just compare that to the methane. For every one methane, you require two chlorines. So one half of 0.21 is 0.105. That's what you need to be the perfect mole ratio, but do you see what you were given? <laughs> 0.31. Clearly that's too large, that's excess amount. So that's your excess reagent. Alrighty, so limiting reagent for part B, we're calling that chlorine. How many moles of product are formed? Well, it doesn't tell us what product. Let's, we have to pick one. Let's just pick this one because it's written first. C2H, CH2Cl2. How many moles of product? I'm not sure how you tackled that when you did this on your own. You might have solved both products. I'm going to choose to solve the CH2Cl2 and just kind of go through that as practice. So I'm going to say that I can see that every one mole of CH2Cl2 consumed, what was the limiting reagent? And it was the chlorine, wasn't it? So I need the coefficient of two for chlorine. So 0.21 divided by two, 0.105 moles of CH2Cl2 formed. Then we're asked to do that molar mass. I've got to add that up. Carbon is 12, two more on the hydrogens, two chlorines is 71, 14 plus 71, that's 85 grams as the molar mass of CH2Cl2. Alrighty, so 85 times that previous answer, an 8.925. This is our theoretical yield. Well, all right, I think I did pick the right product because it says, what if we only produced 5.6 grams and I should have produced 8.93 grams? How efficient was my equation? What was the percent yield? 5.6 divided by my theoretical answer, express it as a percent. So slide that decimal over and you'll have 62.7% yield. Oh, you're in the home stretch. Do you feel it? You have one more to check with me. Ooh, let's see what we have. Sucrose plus water yields ethanol plus carbon dioxide. What is the molar mass of sucrose? Well, that's taking carbon. There's 12 of them there and each one weighs 12. And then we have 22 hydrogens and each one weighs one. And oxygen weighs 16 and there's 11 of those. Let's sum 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens and 11 oxygens. 12 times 12 plus 22 plus 16 times 11 gives me a total molar mass of 342 grams per mole for sucrose. Let's balance the equation. Okay. 
Let's do a T-chart. We've got a balance C's, then H's, then O's. Those are the three different elements. On the left side, let's count carbons. I see 12 carbons. I see 22 plus two more hydrogens. And I see 11, 12 oxygens. All right, so that's what I count on the left. Let's do the same on the right. I have one, two, and one more is three carbons. I have six hydrogens. And I have one, two, three oxygens. Now, how do we go about balancing this? Something interesting I, I just noticed. Do you see how the carbon ended up in two different spots? It might not be the best place to start. I noticed that hydrogen ended up in just one spot. It might be the easier place to start. And then the oxygens are also separated, aren't they? So that's not really a good place to start. Because the hydrogens are found in just one place on both sides, why don't we get them working? Just as an idea of where to start and see how it goes from there. With the hydrogens, all together I have 24. Oh, they didn't stay apart. Hydrogens, oh, that's not true either. That's not correct. Hydrogens were separated. Duh. Okay. So. We're just going to jump in and see how it goes. I have carbons at 12 to 3. So hydrogens 24 and 6. I have a hunch that we're going to leave that big sucrose as a 1 and try to get things working from there. Um, let's see, 2 carbons, that's 10 more. So here's what I'm thinking. Just I'm just thinking that what if we have 12 total carbons here? I have two here, that's 10 more. What if we started with a five in front of the carbon dioxide? I'm just diving in as a place to start. Oh, I don't even need a five, I need a 10. Let's see how that goes. Let's just fix the T-chart. I'm sure you're doing this like me, you're just diving in and trying things. Because all I did was notice I can get 12 carbons to balance by putting a 10 in front of CO2 plus two more, that's 12. All right, let's fix the T-chart. On the right side, I have 12 carbons. And now I have 10 times two is 20 oxygens plus one more. All righty. So I don't know if that's right, but I gotta start somewhere. How about carbons are good, hydrogens are next. 22, 24 over there. Um, three is 18. And I really don't want to mess that carbon. All right, that 10 isn't working. And I just want to applaud you for, you know, just trial and error. And, and I just can't get it to work that way. So I'm going to go back and just revisit what we have so far. And this is a doozy. I'm not saying that they're all easy, but you got to keep practicing and just putting coefficients there. Now, I need 12 carbons. So I'm just brainstorming a way to get four times two, that's eight, eight carbons. And what if I got four more is eight plus four, 12. Oh, what about trying that? All right, so let's, and again, I tried 10, I couldn't get it to work. But what if we tried a four and see where it gets us? Let's just retabulate our chart. Four times two is eight plus four more. We got the carbons working. Let's see what happened to the hydrogens. We had four times six, that's 24. And oxygens last. Four times two is eight plus four more, that's 12. Oh my gosh, we ran into it. Okay, Woo, we did it. A four to four ratio balanced that equation. Okay. Whew. All right, one to one to four to four. Now the rest of these will be easy. How many moles of ethanol form when I start with two moles of sucrose? This is a mole-mole problem. I just want over given. I want to know ethanol. 
that's coefficient is a four. Four moles of C2H6O set over one mole of sucrose. Four times two is eight moles. How about letter C? How many moles of water are needed to react with 10 moles of sucrose? Well, that's a one-to-one -one ratio, do you see it? Your C12, H22, O11, that's your starting material. We want to know water, its coefficient is a one, as is the coefficient of your sucrose. So there that is also 10 moles. Letter C. Letter D. Check. How about letter E? 0.55 moles of sucrose. And we want to know there grams of ethanol. Well, the ethanol mole we said was four. Starting from the mole of sucrose, and we want it to go all the way to grams. So that means I need a molar mass of C2H6O. So let's add that up. Carbon is 12, but there's two of them plus six more from the six hydrogens, and then 16 from the oxygen, that molar mass is 46 grams. 0.55 times four over one times 46, and that's 101.2 grams of your ethanol. How about letter F? How many grams of ethanol? from 34.2 grams of sucrose. Given a mass, calculate a mass. Those are the three steps to stoichiometry. Step one, we need to divide by the molar mass of our starting material, C12, H22, O11. We found that earlier, it's 342 grams. Our want over given ratio. We want to know ethanol, its coefficient is a four. From the coefficient of sucrose, which is a one. Last step, we'll multiply by molar mass, which would determine to be 46, just from the problem up above. So we divided, we ratioed, we multiplied. 34.2 divided by 342 times 4 times 46. That's 18.4 grams of ethanol. Letter G. What is the theoretical yield of ethanol if 17.1 grams of sucrose formed? What is the theoretical yield of ethanol starting from 17.1 grams of glucose? So the only difference from F to G is our starting material, but it's the same work. So I'm just gonna say the same work and I can come up with a new answer. We have to divide, ratio, multiply, but the only difference between what I wrote down in letter F and, and letter G is my starting mass. So I'm gonna say 17.1 on my calculator. Then I'll divide by the 342. I'll multiply by four over one. I multiply by 46, and I found 9.2 grams of ethanol. And with that, we're able to answer letter H. If 1.25 grams of ethanol formed, oh boy, that's not very good. That's a very low yield. We know that we should have formed 9.2 grams. What was the efficiency of your equation? Not very good. 
this is 16% yield. That would be back to the drawing board for experimental design. Well, you have been doing such good work. When you have your notepad completed, you will be proficient with balanced equations, stoichiometry, the concept of limiting and excess reagents, and percent yields. You should feel very accomplished.